Will, can you say something? Whoa, how are y'all this morning? There we go. We're on, we're in business. Um, I think we're doing well. I just got done eating about five pounds of steak for breakfast. So I'm, I'm really good, man. <laughs> I how are things, how are things in Georgia for you? Are you guys getting froze out there? Or is the cold weather affecting you guys like the rest of the country? It's, you know, it's cold for us. You know, most of y'all would scoff at what I consider to be cold. The, the Gulf of Mexico is 80 miles right over there. So it, uh, you know, if we have a little thin skim of ice on the horse trough, we think it's a blizzard. But uh, we, uh, it's about 30 degrees, which is mighty cold for us in the middle of the day in Georgia. That is. That is indeed. I've, I've lived in some cold places. I'm about to move up to another cold place. I lived in Wyoming for, Cheyenne, Wyoming for about five years. And to me, that was cold. That was 20 below and wind, wind blowing 60 miles an hour. That was not fun. I remember those days. But uh, anyway, well, before we get started, Will, I just want to thank you it, it, just in, in general terms for doing what you do. I think, you know, we, you guys, I don't know if you hear it enough, but I say it every time I get to talk to a rancher. Thank you for what you do. Thanks for feeding us. Uh, you know, it's an it's, it's underappreciated profession. And I mean, it's, it's so incredibly vital. And I think more and more people are waking up to us. And you have a community of people that all appreciate. We're all meat eaters here. We, uh, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to survive, basically. Our health depends upon stuff that uh, being able to, you know, get this wonderful, nutritious product that you guys produce to your hard work and sweat and passion. So thank you for doing that. Mutual, mutual respect. You know, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes all of us to create a re- rethinking industry. So thank you for, for the words you spread. Well, let me add, I'm just going to get right to it. I mean, I, you know, I interviewed you a couple of years ago. I mean, I think folks know, you know, White Oaks Pastures, you guys are doing the right thing, doing regenerative ag. You've got that epic study that, you know, showed that uh, you're, you're able to sequester carbon. That's clearly demonstrated. I'm sure you're continuing to do that. There is a lot of noise afoot. You know, we got Bill Gates buying up all the farmland. We got people saying, you know, we're we're gonna we're, we're you're gonna you're gonna get used to eating synthetic meat. That's his that's his latest thing. You better like it because synthetic meat is where we're going. Does that concern you at all? And and what are your thoughts on the likelihood of that happening? Uh, it, it, it it concerns me that I feel like uh, a lot of damage will be done to a lot of people in that process. You know, my. Well, what, uh, let me, before I ask that, let me, let me say this. One of the things I really appreciate here is how I've, I've read and studied a lot of you, your message, and you and I have arrived at the same place, which is an appreciation of this production model, coming from very different perspectives. You, an athlete and a physician, me, a herdsman, a land steward. And it's just incredible to me that we both have found this regenerative, uh, humane, rural community building uh, passion in common. So I'm very grateful for that. And I feel like Mr. Gates uh, has no idea what this model, the power this model has, no, no, no idea how to do it. I think he is so wrapped up in the uh, uh, technical side, the approach to life, that he didn't understand the nature approach to life. And you know, my, my daddy used to say, uh, he, he'd be driving down the road, he'd see uh, an abused piece of property, he'd say, some, some, some folks some folks ought not, not, not be allowed to own land. And I suspect Bill Gates probably shouldn't be allowed to own land, but I don't think he knows what to do with it. Well, I mean, whether he's allowed to or not, he does. And so that's, 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 a, that's a certain concern. You know, obviously, we were in a pandemic of health, a health pandemic, and there's a lot of, a lot of you know, I would, I would say a reaction. Some of it's been good. Some of it's been bad. A lot of it has been without much thought. There's been, you know, it's just, it, it, you know we, we were acting under the guise of this is an emergency. We have to do something right now, you know, we don't know what the consequences are going to be. And obviously we've seen some bad consequences. We've seen arguably some good consequences from it. The next, the next crisis is going to be the climate crisis. We're going to, you know, that messaging is already happening. We've got to do something right now. We've got to, we've got to act right away. We've got to, you know, slash meat production, shut down every coal mine, you know, cut down the pipelines, you know, why this is something that frustrates me because obviously what you're doing is part of the solution. I mean, if, if we're going to make that argument that, that you know, carbon is an issue, clearly 
you guys are doing it. You're doing it every day. There are many more like you. I've interviewed Gabe Brown. I've interviewed, you know, Glenn Elzinga. I've my, my neighbor, Frank Fitzpatrick. I had dinner with the other night. He's doing, I mean, all these guys are in this thing, demonstrating this over and over again, that this can be done. And we don't hear that message enough in the, in the, in the, in sort of the mainstream media. Um, it's, it's, it's like, and, and when it is, it's often there to dismiss it as, you know, you don't exist. Well, what you're doing doesn't exist. This is all fantasy world. You can't do that. And it's like, you know, it's like you black is, is blue and white is, is red. And it's kind of crazy. How do we get this message out bigger? I mean, do you have any, you know, I, I'm trying to get a hold of the, so there's a new guy that got head, got uh, appointed to the head of the NCBA. I guess his name's uh, something, but John Bone or something like that. He's a Kansas cattleman. I'm not sure, sure if you saw, but he just got appointed president. And I want to see, see if I can talk to him and said, Hey, what's the plan? Because, I think the beef industry in general has done a very poor job of, of, of just representing what it actually means. And I know there's different ways to raise it. And you, you're not a fan of the, the, uh, the sort of the uh, factory farming. And I think that's definitely can be improved upon, if not replaced with what you do. But the messaging is not, I, I think, commensurate with, the, with the, the amount of power that you potentially have with, with doing this. And why, why do you think that is? Why do you think we're not hearing about this? Well, I should tell you, I am not a fan of the NCBA. The uh, okay. N- NCBA's parent organization was a group of, of ranchers. And in my opinion, the NCBA has been hijacked by the big meat packers and the big feedlots. So I think the reason you're not getting the message from NCBA is that it's counter to the message of the forces that run the NCBA. Good luck with that guy who... I urge you to try it. Hope it works. Uh, I, 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 I fear it won't. You know, we reference what you said about the, the pandemic and then the, the climate change. You know, I hear a lot that uh, oh, if people say, oh, I just so we, we're destroying the earth. We, we're destroying the earth. Um, and it, don't worry about the earth. The earth will be fine. Mankind may not do so well. You know, I think that. Uh, the, the pandemic that we've had is a function of excesses, and I think that it has shown uh, us some fragility in the food production system. I think that the climate change uh, issues that we are having now is a function of the linear way that we have uh, scaled up uh, all the industries we're part of, including my industry, agriculture. But, but Mother Nature will be fine. She'll take care of herself. We may not do so good. Yeah, uh, you know, and obviously, I think most of us would prefer to be here as human beings. I think I think that's 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 part of that. And I think part of this is, you know, I maintain the argument is that what you do and what you know, meat, you know, in particular, is just an incredibly important part of the nutrition of human nutrition and human health and human mental health. I mean, we see that over and over again. And so I think if we don't have a healthy population, it's, it's kind of pointless as well, you know? And so um, I've had a chance to try some of your, your, your product through a company called Carnivore Snacks. I know you work with Sylvia Tabor is sort of, and that is delicious. I got to tell you, I'm really, really a fan of that. But um, when, um, you know, do you, how much curiosity do people have around what you're doing now that nowadays are more ranchers getting into this are, more people interested in the fact that you're sequestering carbon? Is there any, you know, I mean, so for instance, we've got a guy named Cory Booker, Senator Booker from New Jersey, who is now on the Senate Ag Committee. He is a vegan. He has said that, well, one of the things that you may be in favor, he says, I want to promote regenerative agriculture, which I think we're all in favor of. But the question is, what does he want to do? I mean, is, is, he, is he trying to reduce the overall meat production and, in, 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 you know, overall so we can't have it? Or, you know, I'm kind of, confused as to what his message might be. What is your thought on, on that? Is he a wolf in sheep's clothing, clothing or is he, you know, is he going to be good for your industry? I don't think he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. I, uh, <clears throat> the, he was a proponent of that. The Green New Deal that was so discussed. And the Green New Deal was never really legislation. It was, it was an idea. It was a concept. And some of it was a little far out. Some of it was really on target. Uh, a lot of work needed to be done. I think that he his intentions are good. 
Um, you know, I, I think that uh, I don't. I don't really expect a lot of help from from the, from my government, my politicians. You'll be the amount of money put through lobbyists by big food, big pharma, uh, you know, equipment companies, crop insurance companies is just incredible. So I don't really expect, sadly, I really don't expect much help from the government. You mentioned farmers embracing this. I think a lot of farmers would like to embrace this production model. I don't think it's available to them until consumers embrace this production model. You know, so there's that chicken or egg deal for farmers can't be expected to risk everything to produce food this way in the hope that maybe somebody will buy it from them. They just can't afford to do it. So I think that consumers will lead this. If we see a significant change, it will be led by consumers and people like you informing these consumers is essential. Yeah, I mean, I had a, you know, like I mentioned, my, my friend Frank, Frank Fitzpatrick, who's, you know, he's a proprietor of the, the uh, Five Bar Ranch here in Orange County, California. He, you know, he does what you, kind of what you do, same thing, just completely regenerative, no antibiotics, no hormones, no vaccines. He doesn't castrate his bulls. He's just, everything as natural as it can be. And, you know, uh, he's, he had a buddy who's trying to struggle to sell his, he's got like 28, you know, sides of beef he's trying to, trying to, trying to get rid of. And I, I, you know, I basically just put a social media post up said, hey, man, there's a rancher needs help. Can you help him out? And, you know, I think I think he sold out pretty quickly. So I think getting the message out there, I think the will of the people is out there to do it. It's just, you know, getting on the message, because I think my concern is, is, is the same as yours. I mean, you've got Tyson Foods, you've got Cargo, you've got JBS, you've got National Beef, which is now Marfrig, owning 80 percent of the beef supply and they're protein companies and they're 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 going to delve into synthetic meat they're going to delve into plant-based meats and whatever's going to make them the most profit and I, you know i've, I've agreed i've talked with a lot of ranchers you know with regarding the ncba and it does seem to be a packer a packer organization you know because they, they probably fund them uh you know I, I suppose and so the interests are not aligned and so i think what you do is more in line with my interests my health interests than what you know tyson foods is doing for sure and so i think that uh you know, just getting that message out over and over again. I don't know, you know, like I said, I implore all the people around me that I talk to, to, to support local ranchers, to talk to them. And then I'm hoping that the ranchers will become more vocal. And I know it's, you're busy. You got a lot of work to do. It's not, a, you know, it's not a leisurely job taking care of animals 365 days a year. So you don't have time for that, but hopefully we can get some sort of collective messaging. I mean, the one thing that frustrates me is frustrates me is with beef checkoff or NCBA, they haven't really advertised this stuff. I mean, the last thing I can remember was beef It's what's for dinner back in the 1990s. And since then it's been, they've gone silent. And so it's kind of concerning yeah. about that. You know, those big, those big packers that, uh, that I feel like run the NCBA also invest in the vegetable protein. So they're, you know, it's all about the money for them. It's not about the industry. One, a comment I'll make about uh, growing interest in the community is uh, we uh, have formed a, an internship program and we did it in self-defense. I really didn't want one. I had so many people wanting to come here that we sat down and built an internship program. We get about 25 applications for six vacancies four times a year. Uh, we, we've actually built cabins of a restaurant on the farm because we have so many visitors here. And I didn't want to be in the agritourism business, but when people come and want to see what we do, we wanted to do a good job showing them, so we accommodated it. And we're about to uh, launch a real educational component to our program. We've hired a person that's an educator to, you know, people, people want to come here and want to learn, and we're ill-equipped to teach them. We can show them, but we're not teachers. Well, we're, my degree is in animal science, not, not education. Not a, so um, there, there's a growing interest, and I... I just hope it moves fast enough to get ahead of, of whatever comes next. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I know you had a little documentary film, short film back several years ago, and I watched that. I can't remember when it was, maybe five, five years ago, something like that. How is Bluffton doing these days? Because one of the things you kind of lament is the, the, the decimation of rural America. You know, as uh, jobs dry up, as the farms go under, I mean, the, the, these little small towns, which, 
you know, many of us still cherish. I mean, there's, there's obviously a huge urbanization of the population, but some of us like, like I'm getting ready to move to a relatively small little town of 9,000 people. I'm going to be on five acres. And maybe if I'm lucky, I'll be able to figure out how to put a cow in there too at some point. But, but anyway, I mean, what's going on in Bluffton? Has, has what you've done uh, impacted the town? And do you think there's, there's room for continued improvement in that area? Uh, thank, you. thank you for asking that. That's a sore surprise. And what we've done here is highly replicatable. Uh, um, 20 years ago, I had four employees and was selling about a million dollars worth of live cattle a year. Today, I got 176 employees who sell 20 something million dollars worth of product a year. My employees make way over the county average, and we're the largest private employer in the county. And what that's done is it's, it's literally changed Bluffton from a ghost town where you could only buy a stamp to uh, a, a, a destination. We've got people coming here to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of that. You know, we, our basic tenets here are animal welfare, regenerative land management, and rural re-enrichment. And the first two were very very intentional. You know, I, I didn't like the way I was farming. I studied the, the alternatives and made some very definite choices about animal welfare and regenerative land management. And some of it worked, some of it didn't. If it didn't work, I changed it. And it was all intentional. The third component, the, the revitalization of this little town, was purely organic. Never was a goal, never set out to do it, just the changes I made for the land and the animals caused this revitalization of the little town. And the reason is the way I was farming previously, industrial commodity centralized agriculture rendered the town irrelevant. It became economically irrelevant. So it dried up. And when we changed the way we farmed, we made it again economically irrelevant and life came back to it. This is a, this is a nice place. You ought to come see. Me. Yeah, I want I want to do that. Now I don't know how far you are from Atlanta. I guess what are you on? You on you on the west part of Bluffton? You said Gulf of Mexico, so I assume you're kind of western western uh, uh, Georgia, I, I guess. Bottom bottom left corner, almost Alabama, almost Florida. You know we yeah, say. I'd love to- yeah, I would love to do that, Will. I've got my my uh, my better half sister just moved to Atlanta, so we'll probably be in Georgia for a visit. So I can make the drive a couple hour drive down there and take a take a look. You know what you're describing. You know it's kind of interesting because I know we hear about the biodiversity coming back. You know the the wildlife, the bees, the birds. You know the different wild animals, the foxes, the deer. When you do this, but now you're describing there's the humans come back too. I mean it's like. The, the, the human diversity comes back because it, they want to be there. It's not a, it's not a uh, you know, I, I don't think living much near a bunch of monocrop cornfields and soybeans is not that appealing. But if you've got a thriving, biologically diverse, pleasant place, I mean, it's more pleasant for humans as well. And I think that's really, really amazing. Um, any of your neighbors, I mean, I mean, I don't know how many ranchers are in, 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 in that county, are any of them picking up on your message? I mean, have you? I mean, I'm, I mean, you're, you're. I'm sure you've inspired many people throughout the country, but sometimes it's like your family. You know, you can. You, I can motivate people all around the world, but sometimes my own family, man, my mother and my sister, I, I struggle with. I mean, what's it like locally there? Well, uh, that, you know, what you what you describe is exactly the way it is. There's a number of people doing a really good job with this kind of agriculture across the country. But sadly, right here locally, it's not happening. And one, one of the, the reasons are, first, this is the poorest county in one of the poorest states in the country. So uh, that just doesn't lend itself to really progressive sorts of change. Second, the, the economics, <laughs> the, way, the way my neighbors farm, the way I used to farm, is very capital-intensive, low return, but it's low risk, the risk return ratio, right? What I do is very capital intensive, very low margins, but it's very high risk. So uh, understandably, uh, these people aren't going to, to uh, can't, can't justify 
risking everything they have to change the way they farm, and there's no safety net. You know, with the government programs like federal subsidized crop insurance and irrigation pump water out of the aquifer and pesticides to kill whatever's bothering you that day, and on and on, there's a lot of safety nets under a commodity industrial farmer that I don't enjoy. Yeah, what do you find, uh, you know, and I, I know you talk about the government's not going to say, and I, and I, I, I firmly am, am skeptical that we can rely on some law to be passed because, I, you know, like I said, there's too much conflict of interest. But I think that, you know, ultimately it's going to be a consumer movement. And I think it's starting. I mean, I think, I mean, you know, you're probably seeing that a little bit. And I, I certainly am talking about it every chance I can. But, you know, when we talk about these commodity subsidies, you know, the grain subsidies, uh, the, the crop failure subsidies, so on and so forth. Do you, th do you feel that there's any sort of potential thing that can help you out with carbon credits? I mean, I know, that, I know, that, I know that's a hot topic. I know we got Bill Gates buying carbon credits from regenerative ranchers in Australia now. So do you, do you feel that there's, there's something else incentive based other than just uh, taking a risk and rolling the dice? Because I mean, I mean, I think there's a lot of people out there like, People like myself, and, and I, you know, I know this, I, I talked to, I'm, I'm, I, I, you probably know a fellow named Greg Judy. I don't know if you know him or not, but I talked to Greg, Greg, and I said, hey, what about the, 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 the engineer, the, the retired lawyer or doctor says, hey, I want to get into agriculture. Can I do it? And he says, yeah, and, and a lot of people do, and they do well because they're not indoctrinated by, you know, they don't have any preconceived notion of how you're supposed to farm. So they learn how to do it from, from the beginning. Do you find that that is a potential source of getting more ranchers? You get people coming up to you and say, hey, Will, how do I become a rancher? Absolutely. Uh, I told you we, we, we uh, train 24 interns a year, and, and none of them talk like me. You know, they're all non-farm, non-silver, non-rural. Usually they're not kids either. They're uh, people in their 30s that have been in a uh, career they didn't like and they, they came here to learn how far because they want to get into a different meeting to change the way they live. Um, so yeah, I'm, 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 I'm convinced of that. I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about it. And I don't want to say, I'm, I'm not a whiner. You know, I, I am uh, supported by a customer base that is very good to me and it's growing. You know, the, the biggest enemy we have is green washed product by multinational corporations that uh, talk about their product so it sounds like what we do, but, but it's not. Uh, that is sadly, that's growing as fast as the consumer uh, acceptance is growing. So it's, it's, it's taking up a lot of the air in the room. And I think that as, as consumers become increasingly uh, sophisticated and, and don't believe everything they read on a glossy brochure or see on a, uh, some of these advertising these poultry companies just absolutely are ridiculous indicating of how they raise chickens versus what I know they really do. Yeah, there's not a lot of transparency, you know, and I think sometimes, you know, they, the way we have labeling is just it's it, it doesn't really particularly help. I know that the, like the Savory Institute has a has a I think it's called an em, environmental outcome verification system that says we can we verify that this is actually improving the environment. And there's been are you supportive of that type of thing? I know there's some ranchers say why do I have to pay money to to to, to extra expense to to prove what I'm doing? How how do we get that that information to the consumer? I mean, is there, you know, because USDA, you know, whether it's prime or choice or if you stamp natural or organic, doesn't really mean anything. As you know, it's just a bunch of smoke and mirrors marketing terms. How do we know what we're getting? So, so uh, let me say this. USDA um, food labeling laws are intentionally deceptive, intentionally deceptive. Uh, you, can, you can buy beef at your grocery store and label product of the USA and the cow was born, raised, and slaughtered in Australia or Uruguay, New Zealand. That's, that happens all the time. I can talk about that all day. Uh, I, let me say that you mentioned slavery. That is one of the certifications we hold. We hold a bunch of them. Community likes merit badges to the Boy Scouts. And, and I think that the slavery land to market uh, verification, which is part of that ecological outcome verification that you referenced, 
is a very good one. But those, all of those certifications, certified humane and uh, regenerative organic certification, all of them have lost a lot of their luster uh, because while there's some very good ones, there's some really low hanging fruit out. So you can get a certification on any shade of gray from smut black to snow white. And the consumer is just jaded with it. So they, they can't learn all that. I can't keep up with it. And I do it for a living. So they go to the grocery store and say, okay, good. It's got certification. That's great. And sometimes that's as misleading as the USDA food label. You, you, that's not a question. You got to know your farm. You, you know, you got, and, and luckily with like social media, that's easier than it used to be. You know, it would be great if you could come to White Oak Pastures and visit or go see Greg Judy or Spencer Smith or Gabe Brown or Greg Gunthorpe. These are great guys. Go see them. But if you can't, if you, can watch, if you can follow them on social media and if you know that you could go, if you know you could, you know, transparency and authenticity are our shield and sword against greenwashing. So you may not come see me, but if you know that people come see me every day, then that's a, that's, that's a lot better than the certification or USDA label. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the local thing is, I think, great. Like I said, I, I, you know, I, was, I was surprised to find out that I had a fellow that was not 10 miles from my house. And so, of course, I went up there and got to visit, hang out on the ranch, walked with the animals, had dinner with them. You know, you, you partake in some of his product. And uh, that's really a really a neat thing. Let me ask you about, um, I saw something where they said a lot of farmers or ranchers are sort of organically going to this because they're finding that there is some degree of profitability on this. Obviously, I would assume you're more successful from a financial standpoint now than you were as a commercial, you know, as a typical commercial farmer. So there is, because I think a lot of them, you know, they're going to go where the money is too. And so if you can demonstrate your inputs are less, your overhead is less because you don't, you're not paying for all the big equipment and the pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers. How does that, can you, can you sell someone on doing this from a financial standpoint? I know you mentioned risk. Well, only if you have the market for it. So uh, one thing I'll, I'll, I'll correct a little bit. Make no mistake, all those things that farmers buy, chemical fertilizers, pesticides, GMOs, all of those were created not to add cost of production. Those were created to take cost out of production. And they do. The per year, you spend more for the chemical fertilizer, but it, give, it should give you more yield than you invested in the input. So all those inputs that you spend money on actually cheapen your per unit cost of production. So you cannot do what we do here, what Gabe does, those other guys, and sell into the commodity market. You, 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 you just can't do it. You've got to find the market that will pay the premium for the for the quality you're putting in the product. You cannot extract that from the commodity market. And the difficulty in that is uh, there's three legs on the stool. There's production out here in the pasture. That's what we all want to do. That's what, that's what gets us up in the morning and what we enjoy. It's just my hobby, my advocation. That's, that's what we do. We love that. But, but you got to get it in a form that's monetizable. You know, consumers don't buy hogs and cows and sheep. They buy beef and pork and lamb. So that, that processing function has got to be handled. And then there's got to be the marketing, marketing and distribution. You've got to find some, some consumer out there that will consistently pay enough for it to cover the increased cost of production as you move away from the commodity centralized system. Now, those costs in the commodity system are still there. They're just externalized. Yeah, so they're uh, when you mean they're externalized, you mean they're they're borne by the taxpayer or some other system. So we're paying for it one way or the other, whether it's at the supermarket or through our federal taxes. Is, is I guess is what you're saying. That and the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico and the 
uh, amount of greenhouse gases that we're putting up, and you know, on and on about the externalized cost that that commodity centralized model puts out that, that we that we all could, whether you buy the product or not. One of the things, and maybe you can, maybe you've noticed this or not. I don't know. I, I, I talked to Alan Williams, Williams, who's another big fella in the regenerative ag world, and he was talking about um, local climate. You know, uh, the fact that the, the local weather actually changes uh, with with this style of agriculture. I know there's a guy out in the desert in Mexico. I forget what his name is, but uh, he's doing it out in the Chihuahuan Desert. And he's literally have impacted the local rain supply. Have you noticed any any of that? Have you seen that in your own personal experience, or been familiar with that? I, I absolutely do. I you know, I can't uh, I can't uh, quantify it, but uh, the, our white oak pasture is, is 3,200 acres here, and another 1,425 is only six miles away. And I've got an aerial photo, and the land looks completely different from everything around. It. So in the summer, when the sun is beaming down on that naked earth, heat's going up. And this is like an oasis. You know, the, the, this, this is where the rain dumps. So I, I absolutely believe that there are micro environments, micro climates that are impacted. You know, what, you know that's, 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 that's the, the, the wrong in this linear approach that we've taken is that it, it, it loses sight of the fact that everything's connected. Everything's connected. You know, the microbes and the soil. I used to feed corn to cattle. Now I make compost and feed it to microbes in the soil, that feed the soil, that feed the plants, that feed the cattle, that feed us. You know, it's, it's all circular. It's not, not linear. Yeah, I, I missed commenting in the chat. Uh, Stephen Swick reminds me that Alejandro Carrillo is a guy that's in, in Mexico doing the doing this stuff there. Um, do you, so have you had any follow-up, you know, on that Epic study where you demonstrated, uh, has anybody, what's, what's come of that, you know, for, for you? Is that, I mean, I know it was about two, two, three years ago that study came out. Have you still had people talking about that follow-up studies? You know, have you seen any more information on carbon sequestration in your, your facility or any of your colleagues' facilities that are doing, doing similar stuff? I, I have, and, uh, First of all, let me say that, that that's, that's, you know, when I, 25 years ago, when I decided to change the way I farm, you can bet Will Harris didn't walk outside and say, you know, I believe I can sequester some of this carbon and, 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 and help climate change. That didn't happen. It didn't work like that. Will Harris looked at his land and saw things happen that he didn't like and saw land in the edge of the woods that looked like I wanted and, and that biomimicry emulation of nature moved and started moving in that direction. And it worked. The land got better. And I didn't need a scientific report to tell me that. I could see the productivity. I could see the difference in color. You know, I got, I can, you can't see it, but I can. I got a sample of soil from my land and my neighbor's land. It looks like it came from two different planets. So the scientific study was great, and I appreciate it. And it has, it has helped us. It's quantified what we do. But I didn't need it to, to show I'm doing what I set out to do. The the follow up studies there have been some, and it's it's uh, and and all of them have shown that we sequester carbon. All of them showing that. But you know it's it's typical scientific bickering that they do different scientific analytical procedures. And some say no, it's less. Some say no, it's more. And that troubles me because it moves this discussion, this wide open passage discussion from the bigger picture to just sequestering carbon. And sequestering carbon is important. It's an essential part of it. We need to do it for many reasons. We've talked about it all day. But this is not just about sequestering carbon. This is about the, the uh, keeping water from rushing down the Gulf of, uh, the, the rubble to the Gulf, carrying pesticides and nitrates and phosphates. This is about changing the climate, the microclimate in Utah. It's about a hundred things. It's not just about carbon, but that's dominated the conversation. You, you mentioned carbon credits uh, uh, earlier. <clears throat> Somebody was talking to me about that. I said, you know, I, 
I think carbohydrates are like unicorns. You, know, you, you hear about them, but I, you know, I, I don't know about his cash to check. Well, um, you know, maybe that'll change. We'll have to see. I mean, but re regardless, and, and I, you know, like you, I don't need a study to tell me that eating meat is healthy for me, you know, and, and, and we are getting those studies, by the way. Harvard's going to put out a study showing people eating an all-meat diet, and I've seen the results, so I know it's going to show some, some significantly positive things. There's other studies in the way. Let me ask you about productivity, because I know you said it's not my job to feed the world, it's my job to feed my neighbors, and I understand that sentiment, but at the same time, at the end of the day, people in cities got to eat too, and productivity. I've talked to guys like Glenn Elzing and others that said, look, I've, I'm able to run more head of cattle on the same patch of land that I used to run conventionally. Are you finding that particularly, you know, you got guys like Joel Salatin who's running, you know, stacked enterprises where he's got cows and sheep and chickens and I don't know what the hell, goats and pigs and everything on there. What are, what are, you, what are your thoughts on the productivity of the land? Can you improve the, your productivity by doing what you're doing? Can you get more yield out of the same acre? And there is no question that we raise the, the productivity of the land. But now, let's, let's be, that's a slippery slope. You know, we talked earlier about all those, those technological inputs like chemical fertilizer and pesticides. That does increase productivity incredibly. And it comes with a great cost, great cost to, to the environment and, and the other things. But it, it does increase productivity. And because I'm one of the good old boys that used to farm industrially and came to this kind of gentler kind of agriculture, I still talk to the guys in the industry. And, and the, the state, you know, the, 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 the go-to is always, you can't feed the world like that. Well, now, the earth has a carrying capacity. And I don't know what it is, but it has a carrying capacity. There can be too many people. And if land is the limiting factor, industrial farming, factory farming is probably better than what I do. But if it's fossil fuel, mine's better. If it's uh, destroying the, the seas, mine's better. If it's antibiotics, that are, uh, pathogens that are resistant to antibiotics, mine's better. If it's, I can go through dozens of scenarios in which my way of farming will feed more people than factory farming. But if you just focus on land, which is where they want to take it, they probably outdo it. But it's so reductive, it comes at a great cost. Do you see any uh, room for a hybridized type model, if, if that's the case? And then, you know, they're going to make the argument. I've seen some people, you know, I mean, even you see people that are saying they have grass fed animals that could mean anything. I mean, that's, you know, that means turn them out in the pasture, let them roam around for six months and come get them at the end. I know Greg Judy called it the Columbus method. You know, you go turn them out in May and discover them in October and uh, they've just chewed down and destroyed, you know, destroyed the land rather than regenerating it. So uh, is there a way to, to take these cow calf operations, these, these stocker op operations, move them, move them appropriately. And then, you know, if, if you're going to try to produce a yield, turn them over to a feedlot. I mean, is that, is that even a, even a compromise that would be, would be workable or what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I, I've never had that discussion. I've been willing to have the discussion, but the at first blush is kind of like being a little bit pregnant. You, you know. Okay. Yeah, I get that. What, uh, what do you hope to see in the next, you know, five, 10 years as far as uh, agriculture goes? And what I would like to see is this sort of model replicated over and over and over again. You know, this model that we have here is not highly scalable. It's just not. It, it, there's a lot of reasons for that. It is highly replicatable. And what we've done here was done by a College of Agriculture C student with bank loans, not a, a Fulbright scholar with an endowment. So it's highly replicatable. I think there should be an operation like this one or Gabe Browns or Greg Gunthorpe or Spencer Smith in every agricultural county in the, in the country, or two or three, and I think it could be. The only thing it lacks is the, the consumer's will to make it happen. There's plenty of us out here that will do it. 
Speaking of, uh, you know, Gabe Brown, um, I, you know, I interviewed him, uh, I don't know, three, four months ago. And one of the things he talked to me about, which I thought was interesting, is that he was in negotiations with one of the big four meatpacking companies. And I, I don't know which one he wouldn't tell me, but my guess is probably either Cargill or Tyson because they're U.S.-based companies. But he said they are starting to show at least some degree of interest in, in what you guys are doing. And so do you think there's any potential well like let me let me put it this way like mcdonald's i know in canada i think has been sort of supporting sustainable agriculture do you think the consumer through these big other corporations you know restaurants places like that could be a point of of uh, entry to to move this 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 movement forward uh, i hope so uh, i should tell you that gabe brown is my best friend and we've had this discussion and he has more confidence in these big corporations than I do. Uh, you know, my fear is they'll just use it for greenwashing because I've seen them do it so much. His hope is that uh, it's just the real deal and because they are so big and so powerful, they can move the needle a lot. And I, I see that. But he, you know, he says that I'm overly uh, uh, pragmatic and I think he's probably a little overly idealistic, and we'll see. I hope he's right. He's he, he's the man to do it. I can tell you that. He, he's great. Yeah, I, I didn't. Like I said, I hope so because I mean we could use all the hands we can get. Because I mean I think the uh, the Bill Gateses of the world, uh, the you know the drug companies, uh, the multinational food companies, the Monsantos, and so forth. They are got a lot of power, a lot of influence, and they control the media. They control the research. Um, it's tough. It's a tough road to hoe, you know. Uh, and you know, like I said, my hats off to, to you guys that are doing it and the people that are willing to support you. And so, um, what, do you find that uh, you know you talk about more people doing it? Is there a, a best source on how to do this? I know Greg's Greg Judy's doing some work, and the Savory Institute's got some work. Where do people learn to do this? And I, and, you know, I've got people in the comments saying, I want to be a rancher. And I, every time I interview a rancher, I get someone saying, I want to go be a rancher. If they want to do it, how do they do that? I really do think that you should find a producer whose model you want to emulate and, and go to work for them. You know, that's the reason we created our intern program. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it would be it would be best if you could find a rancher in the ecosystem, the same ecosystem that you wanted to ranch in. But the fundamentals are the same. You know, we uh, you know Gabe is in Bismarck, North Dakota. I'm in the Gulf Coast, coastal plains of Georgia. Ecosystems couldn't be much more different. And we talk all the time about the similarities when it comes to the abundance. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm freezing because it's 30 degrees here, and it's probably 40 degrees below zero where he is. Could, could, I get 52 inches of rain a year. He probably gets 8, 12. Uh, couldn't, but the fundamentals are the same. The similarities, the differences are just so striking from the road at 60 miles an hour. The but the, when you get into it, the similarities are striking. The fundamentals are the same. So that's the question is go to work with somebody that's doing, doing what you want to emulate. Do you, do you think there's any technology that's going to come out to you? I know, I know the electrified fencing, you know, that, that you can put up and put down real quick. I mean, seen some stuff with satellite imaging where you can use that to kind of, you know, indicate how and where to move the herds. Do you see any, any, any new, new technology coming out that's going to make this easier for, for, for people to do this? Cause you know, the technology can be good. It can be bad. But what, is, what are the things in the future that might make this even more palatable for people that are, that are wanting to do it as a rancher? So I am not anti-technology. You know, that, there's a, a screen right by a flashing through 60-something cameras real time, surveillance cameras all over my phone. I can see it and you can't. It's right there. You will Skype call. I got, uh, I got, the GPS on all, we got 63 trucks and tractors and pieces of equipment. I got GPS on them. I pull up another screen and see where everybody is real time. You know, you mentioned electric fences, which are great. I, I'm not anti-technology, but I don't lose sight of the fact that technology has kind of got us where we are right now. So, uh, 
I, I don't embrace it. I use it, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always leery of the unintended consequences of, of that sort of thing. Just, you know, for people that aren't familiar with the basics, I mean, I, I assume that's mob grazing, adaptive multipatic grazing, something, something along that. Are you running multiple types of animals on the same peat field? And how do you make that work? Is there any, what are the mistakes that people make? Because there's, you know, I'm sure there's people that try this and they fail. Why are they failing? Well, I will show you the, uh, <clears throat> so there's two questions, the, the, the basics. The, the basics are, those fundamentals are emulation of nature. And you know, when you have a production issue, if you will in your mind take it holistically back, to how would this be if we humans weren't screwing with it? You'll find the path to, to, to correct the problem, or optimize what you're trying to accomplish. Now that, that's, that's the fundamentals, that's the basics, and it's, that's oversimplified, but there it is. Uh, and, and this 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 thing of, of uh, moving animals, you know, the the way the Earth evolved, the, the best parts of the Earth, the Great Plains, the the Serengeti Plains of Africa, even the tundra, it evolved by huge bands of ruminants being slowly chased across the landscape. So what you would have had is a hard animal impact as those animals walk slowly across, staying away from the predators eating everything there, hard impact on the land, a lot of urine, a lot of feces, those cloven hooves pushing uh, plant material into the earth. And th those are the basics, and that's what we try to emulate here. Uh, I, the multi-species, we, we raise cows, hogs, sheep, goats, rabbits, chickens, turkeys, geese, guineas, ducks. We got honey, we got pastured eggs. We, we, we have a lot of different species stacked out there in the pasture. And we do run them multi-species. I no longer follow one with the other the way I tried to do in the early days. One of the things I learned is the animals move at different speeds. You know, there were, there were great cattle drives across the Great Plains. There were, there were never great chicken drives across the Great Plains. There, there's a reason for that. Yeah, that's great, the great chicken drive. <laughs> Um, speaking of, do you, do you do a lot of stuff on horseback? Is that, or are you doing, uh, you know, I, I don't know what, how you do it out there. I mean, I, one day I'm going to come out there for sure and visit cause I'd love to see that in, in, in person. But, uh, do you find that, uh, the older methods, cause I mean, there's obviously things have changed, you know, we've gotten, you know, four wheel drives and stuff. I mean, what are your thoughts on that sort of thing? And how do the, how do the animals, let me ask you, do you notice a difference in the way the animals act since they're, you know, since they're treated differently? Heck yes. Heck yeah. You know, I, our animals don't know people hurt them. They think people are their servants because every time a person shows up, something good happens and people never hurt them. You know, the, only, the only pain we have inflict on animals is the uh, ear tag, which is like piercing your ear. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> but the, the, there's nothing wrong with using horses. We used to use horses. We don't use them anymore. We got nine horses. And we, people ride them all the time, but they, it's really not necessary to move the cattle. The cattle are like Pavlov's dog. You know, they, you, you ring the bell, they start salivating. We move our herds every day. Uh, the, the farm is divided up. It's 32, this this 3,200 acres here is divided up in 112, 30-ish acre pots. Put a herd of a thousand or more animals in there, 24 hours, they've eaten it down, and they know which gate is going to be opened in the morning. And they know about what time it's going to be open. So when you get there, they'll be standing there waiting on you. When you open that gate, you better get your butt out of the way. Yeah, I was going to say they probably get trained to, to that, you know, and it's, it, it, I mean, I imagine as, as, Years go by. What do you keep them about three years before, close to three years before they go to slaughter? Is that pretty typical for you, or what's your what's your time on grass? It's about two years. Two years. Okay. Well, that's that's not that long then, you know. And then this is a thing that you know, some people that don't prefer the taste of grass finished beef. One of the complaints is it's too lean or something like that. How do you modulate that? Because some you know a lot of us that don't eat 
we eat only meat, we don't have any carbohydrates for energy. We need fat in there. So how do we, how do we, how do you raise animals to get enough, you know, enough fat in there so that it, it, it might please the palate of somebody that wants more fat? Well, you know, you know taste, taste is, uh, and that's in the mouth of the beholder, like using the eye of the beholder. Uh, and, and truly, our, our beef is, is different from things like beef. There's no question about that. You know, I swallow animals. They're two years old. Uh, there's, uh, you know, maybe a, uh, maybe a half an inch, three quarters of an inch of back fat, probably not. Uh, where they weigh 1,100, 1,200 pounds. Uh, and they, and, they, and if I left them out there in that pasture, they'd live to be 20 something years old. A feedlot animal is an unnaturally obese creature that would never occur in nature. I mean, they'll weigh, they'll be 18 months old, weigh 1,400 pounds, that much back fat. And if they stood in that feedlot eating corn, gaining three or four pounds a day very long, they would die very early of all the diseases of obesity and sedentary lifestyle that kills most of us. So uh, there's fundamental differences in this beef and that beef. Now, uh, if you want something soft and easy to chew, feedlot beef is your desired product. I mean, it, it's just the way it is. It's fat, it's soft. Ours is not, it, you know, I think it's adequately fat, but you know, it's, it's just what people choose. Now, uh, and, you know, we, we talk so much about uh, about the, the tenderness. And, you know, when you when we slaughter 1,100-pound uh, animals, 1,200-pound animals, it'll hang at about 600 pounds, no longer. That's the carcass weight on the hook. When we, when we take it apart, we're going to wind up with 300 and something pounds of boneless meat and 40, 50% of that is ground beef. And a good portion of the rest of it is um, like uh, braising meats, like roast. So really the, the part that you're talking about comparing tenderness is gonna be the strip and the ribeye. Everybody's for ways to, I mean, come on. So, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't ever, you know, I talk about I don't ever talk about the culinary side of it. I mean, in fact, if my beef doesn't taste good, people aren't going to buy it. It's just simple as that. And apparently it tastes pretty good, so we got to we sell a lot of it. Yeah, I was going to say, I've had it and I've enjoyed it. And I, I found there was adequate fat on it for me. You know, again, it was in the form of a dried product, but it was still fairly fatty. So, I mean, I thought that was, I was quite impressed with that. And the taste was quite good too. So, um so that so you're doing you're obviously doing the right thing from a, from a taste standpoint as well as environmental standpoint so that's that's another great thing um where um you know outside of beef what other animals do you have available will there's cows hogs sheep goats and rabbits on the red meat side and we hand books from here on this farm we got a usda inspected uh, slaughterhouse i believe and we run past the road these chickens, turkeys, geese, guineas, and ducks. And we hand butcher them in a separate USDA inspected warehouse that I built here on the farm. Right. And, and I'll say this, this we generate those 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 plants generate about nine tons a day of what they call five days a week, what they call packing plant waste. We call it a nutrient stream. We compost it. And every bit of that gets put back on the 3,200 plus 1,400 acres of land that we manage. I think one of the things that many people don't realize about it, you know, particularly a cow, is um, every little part of that animal gets used for something, whether it's the bones, whether it's the, you know, the hides, you know, it's in, you know, obviously leather, and you've got it in bone meal, and you've got it in fertilizer, and you've got it in household goods and products. I mean, there's hundreds of products you get from a cow. And so it's a very, you know, efficient uh, system as far as, uh, as far as I understand, you know, you can compare that to some of the other agricultural products where, you know, you know, if, if we didn't, I mean, unfortunately they're feeding a lot of them to, to, to ruminant animals, but otherwise they would go in a waste, you know, landfill. We, we, uh, one of my heroes is George Washington Cobb. And he said many great things. But my favorite is, in nature, there is no waste. 
And we have come so far uh, personally here with that journey. You know, now we sell, uh, we sell a product called, two products, one called Praise the Lord, one called Lord Have Mercy. We got one called Tylo B. By Name. It's all that fat, is what some of you'd be interested in. I, I'll get them to see so it's captured. Uh, we, you know, we even, uh, uh, we, we have a leather shop. We make uh, uh, these leather products and uh, pet shoes, uh, even things like esophaguses and penises and tracheas. We dehydrate the pet shoes. So we, very little, no, nothing is wasted and very little is not monetized. What's not monetized is made into compost and put back on the land. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Will, let me, uh, I want to again thank you. It's, we've gone through an hour. That's usually how long we go on these things. Where do people go to, to, to find out more, to support what you're doing? You know, I mean, or, you know, even if it's, they're a local guy, but how do they get a hold of you in specific and tell us about what products you offer and um, what's your availability like? Is it, are you, are you pretty much 365 days a year? You've got your product you can ship or is it seasonal? What's, what's the story with that? No, well, we, uh, we sell, uh, we sell at the Whole Foods markets and grocery stores. Uh, we used to sell some food service, but the pandemic wound that up. So today, the, the way we like moving our product most is online. We've got an online store. We ship to 48 states through UPS or FedEx and, uh, and then at our website, I think, too, is about all you want to know. If you don't, if you're not, you can reach us. I'm Will Harris at whiteoakpastures.com. Info at whiteoakpastures.com. Go to my daughter and my daughters. Uh, and and, and we, we appreciate the support. But I appreciate it not just for us, but for these other guys that I've mentioned several times. We are not. We're very proud of what we do. We are not the only people in the in the country doing it. So uh, look, look around. If you, if you can't find anybody, buy it from us. But, but look around. Contact me. I might be able to help you. I don't, I don't know anybody in the country that's doing it, but I know some of them. Yeah, we maintain a pretty significant uh, repository of, of ranchers on our website here for people that they're, they're wondering to, to kind of set you up there. But, I mean, I, I kind of consider you guys the last line of defense, and we need to shore up our defenses against this centralization of the food supply because if we lose the independent food producers, we're at the mercy of whatever they want to feed us, and that's going to be whatever makes the most profit ultimately. So thank you again, Will, and uh, thanks for coming on. And I, you know, definitely if I get out to Georgia, I'm gonna, I'll hit you up and try to come out there for a visit because I'd love to see you in person. I hope you hope will, and thank you for having me. I appreciate what you do. All right, everybody. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you guys back tomorrow. Take care, Will, and have a great day and stay warm. <laughs> okay, now, bye-bye, guys. Well.